Coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. Paul was able to spoil the kingdoms of darkness in Ephesus, and the goddess fell and was no more free. Are you hearing what the Spirit is saying? Men who made things and built temples unto the goddess of Diana got rich from those who worshiped their vain God. And because Paul did this, they wanted to kill Paul because it was costing them their livelihood, y'all. Supply and demand. Take away the demand, no need for supply. That's what I want. That's what God's put in my heart to want. When you take away the souls that are demanding of the kingdoms of darkness, you take away that demand. There cannot be a supply, and the, the powers of the enemy dry up. The kingdoms of this world dry up, and the kingdom of God flourishes, and the house of the righteous shall live forever. I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so excited you have joined with us today. Bringing a new word that is entitled, Breaking the Power of Witchcraft. Get out the Word of God, go with me, and let's hear this revolutionary, life-changing word anointed by the Spirit of God. We need to overcome the power of witchcraft. Yeah. Romans 8, 14, Paul's writing to the church, and he says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of the children of God. Are you being led by the Spirit of God? Are you being led by people's voices, by emotions, by desires? But those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. For you did not receive from God the spirit of bondage again to fear. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. But you have received the spirit of adoption. We belong to God, yeah. by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. If you are born again by the Holy Spirit, you are an heir of God. Yes. That's good news. We are heirs of God, and He has given us all that is His. It's at our disposal, and if you can have the faith to believe and receive it, you shall have it, the Bible says. It is God who gives us the power to obtain wealth, to establish, establish His covenant with His people, so that we can enjoy our new life in Christ Jesus to the full. You can have as much of God as you want or as little as you want. You can have as much of what God possesses. He owns the earth, the fullness thereof, and all that dwell therein are as little as much as God has, has possessed. If a person doesn't choose to place their complete faith and trust in God, they will live their life in bondage to a spirit of fear. The problem with fear is it will cause or place us in bondage to people situations, and threats from our enemies. This is how Satan is able to control us as humans, through fear. He does it through the bondage of the spirit of fear. However, faith in God will give you confidence in the natural realm to face problems, to face giants, to face those that oppose you because your confidence is not in yourself, it's not in man, it's in God. And when we place our confidence in God, He gives us His power, His authority, so that we can go in not as a defeated foe, not as the underdog, we're going in as the sons and daughters of the Most High God because we are inheriting His promises, His benefits, and His blessings on our life. Amen. No faith will undermine, no faith, when you have no faith, it will undermine our confidence which opens people up to placing their confidence in man and not in God. This is what happens when people choose to reject God, turn a deaf ear to God. When the preacher comes on television, they turn it off. The rejecting faith in God, then when you have that, it undermines your confidence and it makes you open or susceptible to being in fear to man 
as King Saul was. King Saul was told to take out the um, Amalekites there in 1 Samuel 15, utterly destroy them and all their herds and flocks, but he did not. He saved the best as a sacrifice to God. And God did not, he was displeased with his offering of works. And because of King Saul disobeying God, not only King Saul, but his armies that served under his leadership did not exercise or operate in faith in God, but chose rather to operate of the spirit of the bondage of fear. It said that Saul did not obey God because he feared the people. Consequently, none of them, neither Saul nor his armies, had faith in God or confidence in the natural realm. That's what faith in God does. It transfers into the natural and gives you confidence to face stuff that otherwise shakes you to your core so you can stand up against that. That's good shouting ground right there. None of them had faith in God, nor did they have confidence in the natural realm to face off with Goliath when he defied the armies of God. Only David, a young man who brought lunch out to the battlefield for his brothers because he had a servant's heart, had faith in God, and that faith that he had in God, the same God that took out the lion and took out the bear, that faith rode over him and, and gave him confidence to face down this Goliath. It, he said, it doesn't matter what form the, the enemy comes at me trying to destroy me. I know I've got destiny on my life. I know I've got purpose that is yet to fulfill. And this, this uncircumcised Philistine has no authority over the God that I serve. And he does not shake my confidence in the God that I serve. And so David went out there with confidence. He said, I do not come to you with a spear and a sword, but I come to you tonight in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he will surely deliver you into my hands. When you got confidence, it don't matter how how tall they are. It doesn't matter how strong they look. It doesn't matter how fierce they are. When you come against the child of God that knows who they are, they know that God's going to take them down. Amen. However, people are afraid to face off with the spirit of witchcraft for one reason. It's the spirit of bondage to fear. Fear makes a person or a people subservient to witchcraft. Witchcraft operates and thrives through the spirit of fear. Spirit of fear came upon man when man sinned. 1 Samuel 15 says, when Saul told Samuel what he had done, in order to sacrifice unto the Lord that he had actually rebelled out of stubbornness, Samuel said this, Rebellion is as the spirit or sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry. So when man rebelled, it allowed the spirit of witchcraft to come upon man, and fear fueled that spirit of witchcraft stronghold over people, because we did not have faith in our God who created us, therefore we become subservient to the spirit of witchcraft. Witchcraft has no power except the power that you give it. If we're not in rebellion to God, and David, when he walked out on that battlefield, he was certainly not in rebellion. He walked in unity with God so much so that he knew that God was with him wherever he went or whatever he did. We also will walk in authority over the power of rich, witchcraft and be free from the control of man over us as Christians. And that is why the world hates us, because we cannot be controlled. We will not be conformed to the dictates or the conformity of this world. We are free and independent thinkers because we think and feed on the Word of God. Whom, whom the Son of God says free, they are what? Free. free indeed. When you know the truth and walk in the truth, the truth that you know and walk in shall make you free. You will not be subservient to man's wills, man's dictates, or man's commands because you serve a greater God. You serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and you're free to be who God called you to be and you don't have to listen or cow down to them that trying to tell you how you should live. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 14. I've got to move quickly through this. 
verse 11. God tells us in His Word what happens to those who reject Him, that choose not to place faith in His Son or His Word. Verse 11 says, The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There it is, plain as day. Are you operating in rebellion and unbelief? Are you operating in a spirit of obedience and trusting God through faith? The wicked's tent or house shall be overthrown, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Even in laughter the heart may sorrow, and the end of mirth may be grief. Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he has no sorrow with it. Yet when the wicked have good things in their life, their, their tent, their house is going to be overthrown. And the way that they think is right, but it is not, is the way of death. And even when they have laughter in their heart, there's still sorrow there. And when they have uh, happy times, there is mirth there with grief. And so they live with that dichotomy. It's like, I want to be free, I want to enjoy life, but I don't want to serve God. And because they reject God, they cannot enjoy life. They have life, but they have sorrow with life. They have bitterness with life. They have death with life. Because you cannot have the blessing, the fullness of the blessing on your life apart from God. But the blessing of the Lord for those who are righteous, who live by faith, walk by faith, and live submitted lives unto God by faith, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and adds no sorrow to it. I love that. There's no sorrow to serving God. There's no sorrow living for God. There is no sorrow added to being blessed by God. He will bless you. He will bless the fruit of your labor. And He will rebuke the devourer for your sake when you give your first portion to God. Because you're showing your trust in the Lord. He'll rebuke the curse off of you and off your children, off your children's children and their descendants because you are honoring God with your life and with your possessions. Yes. However... There's only one way. Say one way. one way. There's only one way to spiritually be blessed in this life. It is God and not man who has established this one way for mankind to be blessed. God didn't direct Solomon to write that it is the riches of this world that makes one rich or blessed. But it is the blessing of God that makes us rich. Just because somebody has all the money that can never count, living in a mansion so big they forget where they're at in it, cars so many they can't keep up with it, does not mean they're blessed. It means they're rich. They're rich according to man's standards. However, but whenever we're in Christ and we put our total and complete trust in God, then God's blessing comes on us, and that blessing on us makes us rich. It's not what we have, it's who has us. Now, particularly in America, some seem to believe that riches make them blessed. The blessing that God speaks of here in Proverbs isn't based on riches or filthy lucres, what Jesus calls it there in Matthew 6, but on God's acceptance, God's love, and God's favor on our lives. That's what makes us rich. If God has blessed you, you are blessed indeed. That means circumstances and people cannot curse you. They cannot affect you unless you let that spirit of fear get on you and you allow their words to get into your heart to where you start believing it. When you start believing an evil report, that evil report will become your new reality and you will live in bondage to that when God has said you are blessed. I'm amazed at how free I am for over a year not listening to the world, not listening to the press, how free I am to just come out here and bless week after week after week week after week. I am sacrificing my life of being in the world and appeasing the flesh. But look how free I am to preach the Word of God. If you really want to be free, you'll turn off the wall and you'll turn on God and say, here I am. Download on me. I want it all, God. Yes. Let's digress a moment. After man's sin, we were separated by our sin from God, 
His presence, but not from His love. And we were separated from the ability to understand and know God's ways. Therefore, because man couldn't know God's ways in their sin and rebellion, man began to rely on his own imagination, his own abilities, and strength to gain wealth. That is found in Noah chapter 6. I mean in Genesis chapter 6 about the story of Noah. The vain imaginations and the thoughts that they thought were continually evil. They were devising ways and methods in which they could be blessed or have wealth without doing it God's ways. How do you do that? Everything's God's. You can't be blessed without God. So how can you be prosperous in this earth without God? So man says, wait a minute. We've got to figure out a way that we can be blessed, that we can have prosperity, that we can become wealthy without God being in the equation. So they came up with it. Through vain imaginations, man has devised ways to accumulate great riches. They have also devised ways for them to be great and to build their own empires and kingdoms. Satan says as much there in Luke chapter 4 where he's tempting Jesus and he says, If you will bow down before me and worship me, all the glory and the authority of these kingdoms, which he had shown the kingdoms of the world to Jesus in a moment of time, read your Bible. He says, I will give you the authority and the glory of them. Well, where did those kingdoms come from? Man built them. But how did he build them? Stay tuned, you're going to find out. Mankind has established methods and systems in which they are able to become rich and powerful and build kingdoms and empires for themselves. The ways of man seem right in our eyes, but the end, the Bible said, of these ways is death. What does it profit a person to gain the entire world, but lose or forfeit their soul and spend eternity in torment? What's it going to profit? Well, we figured out how to beat God at His own game. We can set up these systems. We can play on people's weaknesses. We can pray on them. And we can make ourselves rich. And we can become so powerful that we start building our own kingdoms. And that shows God, we did it without you. But what are they going to get in exchange? They're going to lose their soul trying to get back at God because they're bitter at God in their heart. Since so many choose not to believe in God or His Word, Satan has blinded their hearts. 2 Corinthians 4 tells us that. Thus the Word of God has no impact on those who do not believe. They are not blessed by the Word because they reject the Word. The riches of people will perish with their souls because they rejected God's blessings and God's ways, and especially God's Son. Let's talk about that for a moment. Look there in Hebrews chapter 12. It's just getting down there where you live. Hebrews 12, verse 14. It's the story of Esau. And it says in verse 14, Pursue peace with all people, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest any fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness, any what? Root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he, w he was rejected. Whoa. And he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Esau was the rightful heir of the blessing as the firstborn son of Isaac. Unfortunately, Esau had an issue with bitterness and is described as a profane or wicked man. He was also a fornicator. One of the meanings of fornicator in the Greek is male prostitute. But there also is another uh, meaning in there that says this, showing 
are motivated by susceptibility to bribery. Bribery is a big part of humanity. It's a big part of civilization, bribery. Since Esau's heart was wicked, he devised ways to benefit himself. Also, people who have wicked hearts filled with greediness devise ways to make themselves rich. They're opportunists. They're seeking opportunities. Luke chapter 4 again. After Jesus had rejected the temptation over provision, protection, and power, it says that Satan left him for a more opportune time. Therefore, the God of this world has taught the men of this world, the people of this world, how to, if you're going to get ahead in life, you've got to be an opportunist. Take advantage of certain opportunities. They do this by exploiting others and capitalizing on people's vulnerabilities, ignorances, and weaknesses. If you don't know what you have, Somebody who is greedy will know exactly what you have and what it's worth. And if you don't know what it is, they'll capitalize on your ignorance. Yeah. If you don't really know your value in Christ, and somebody comes along and tries to lure you into sin, and you don't know the value of that, Satan will rob that from you. If they see, if opportunists see an opportunity to take advantage of someone for their own benefit, they will seize we're seeing that now. Seizure. They'll seize that opportunity and give no thought to the way they treat others. A person can't follow peace with all people, as the writer of Hebrews tells us under the Holy Spirit to do, and still have greediness in their hearts. It cannot. Peace and greed will not dwell together. So it says that he was, Esau was a profane person who had bitterness a root of bitterness in him, and through that bitterness he was able to defile many. And a root of bitterness in us can defile many in our day, can it not? Look in Acts chapter 8, please, verse 6. Saul of Tarsus, before he was converted by the Lord, made threatenings to the church, persecuting the church, and it caused a great persecution to come up on the early church, and people fled from Jerusalem and went throughout. And Philip was taken by the Lord over to Samaria, and there he began to preach the gospel. But we're going to pick it up in verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the thing spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing with the miracles that he had done. For unclean spirits, that's what I love about the gospel, it gives us authority over unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame, and the lame were healed. And there was, there was great joy in that city. Why? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ came into a city that was under the stranglehold of witchcraft. But when the gospel came in, the people were filled with joy because those that were bound up by fear, the spirit of fear and witchcraft, they found something that was more powerful, that was liberating, and they said, who is this God? We want to know this God. And Philip tells them, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on him. You're going to be saved. And it set that place on fire for God. But, verse 9, there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished, say astonished. astonished. He astonished the people of Samaria claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed. They all gave heed. One man goes into the city of Samaria and through uh, sorcery is able to put them up under the hex of witchcraft so that the entire city came up under his control. He controlled that city through witchcraft, y'all. They all gave heed from the least to the greatest. That means the ones that were on the street that walked it and, and slept at night outside to those that sit in a place of authority, they all gave heed to this one man saying, this man, look at what they said about Simon the sorcerer. This man is the great power of God. That is what happens to a people that have not yet tasted and seen that the Lord is good, that his power is more than I can get rid Rich. His power sets me free so I'm not in bondage to greed to want to get rich and sacrifice my family, my friends, and my relationships in order to make myself rich. 
We're almost out of time, but before I leave you today, I want to encourage you, please mark the time on the channel that you're watching Keys to Kingdom Living on so you can be sure and tune in next week for the powerful conclusion of Breaking the Power of Witchcraft. As Christians, we have authority over Satan. Jesus tells us that much just in Luke 10, 19 and 20. He said, Behold, I give you authority over all the powers of the enemy. You can trample up on serpents and scorpions, and nothing shall by any means hurt or injure us. But he goes on and says, Don't rejoice that demons are subject to us in Christ's name, but to rejoice that our names are written in heaven. I want to ask you a question before we leave today. Is your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? Have you seriously considered where you will spend eternity when you draw your final breath? If you're not absolutely 100% sure, I want to invite you to take a moment right now and invite the Lord Jesus into your heart. It's just simple as, Lord, I come to you as a sinner, but I do not want to remain this way. I want to make heaven my home, and I want to make you Lord of my life. I confess that I have sinned and fallen short of your glory. I confess that I have lived my life on my terms, and it has brought me to the end of my rope. I'm ready to make you Lord of my life, but first, I want to accept you as Savior of my soul. So, Lord, I confess you that you are Lord of all, you are the Son of God, and that you are now my personal Savior and Deliverer from my past, from my sin, and my own ways. And today, Lord, I choose your ways. Teach me by your Spirit, and by faith I receive your Holy Spirit into my life, which is the Spirit of adoption. And today I declare I am a child of the Most High God. If you prayed that, believed it in your heart, the Bible says in Romans 10 that you are saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord in faith shall be saved. That's his word. Congratulations. Would you contact us and let us know you prayed with me? We'd love to hear from you. We'd send you a booklet about the first steps that you're to take now that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, Paul says in Corinthians, and all things have become new for you today. Congratulations, and God bless you in this new walk, this new life that Christ has given to you. If you have any prayer requests or praise reports, as I've told you many times, we are a praying ministry and body of believers. Would you contact us? Let us know how we can pray. The information will be at the bottom of the screen. If you would like a CD or a DVD of this message, ask for it by name, Breaking the Power of Witchcraft. Let the operator know. We'll get it to you as quickly as possible. As I get ready to leave you today, my prayer is that God richly bless, keep you, and know that you're in the palm of His hand when His Son is in your heart. God bless you.